Padmatma Om Vishnu Padaya Krishna Prasthaya Bhutale Srimate Bhakti Vedanta Swamin Itinamine Namaste Sarasate Deve Gauravani Pracharine Nirvishesha Sunyavadi Paschacha de Satarine Jaya Sri Krishna Chaitanya Prabhu Nityananda Sri Advaita Gadadhar Shiva Sadi Gaura Bhakta Vrinda Hare Krishna Hare Krishna 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 Hare 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 Rama Hare Rama 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 Hare Hare This evening's discussion is a follow-up from our visit in the morning to that very nice place that had, in addition to deities of Sita Ram Lakshman Hanuman, there was a special deity of Hanuman, and so this is a Hanuman Kata evening from our visit this morning. Just a little inside scoop. The plan to go to the Balaram temple, when that became known that it was not possible, created a little turmoil in the schedule and the sequencing of things. If I didn't disclose that, you might not have known, but it was definitely a little challenging. And that's why it's a morning class given in the evening. <clears throat> there are many persons, followers of Vedic culture, that are devotees of Lord Ramachandra, Ram Bhaktas. And there are many who are Hanuman Bhaktas. And many of you know probably some persons who are Hanuman Bhaktas. I know some persons who are Hanuman Bhaktas. And it's really easy to feel inspired by the, the Bhakti of Hanuman. Consider for a moment in Rupa Goswami's teachings, the nine processes of bhakti, there's one that's from Ramlila and it's Hanuman because the, he is the epitome. You can't find a better example of Dasya Bhakti than Hanuman. And you know, this nice bold tilak, he's a Vaishnav, so we're honoring a Vaishnav. And again, a theme of what we're doing is the theme of bhakti itself. It's pleasing the personality of Godhead. By definition, Rupa Goswami's definition, aside from what bhakti isn't, it's not taking shelter of jnana or karma, but it's Anukoyena Krishna Anushilanam Bhakti Uttama. The topmost form of bhakti, Uttama form of bhakti, is Anukul, that which is ple accepting, that which is pleasing. Of course, it says Krishna. Anukoyena Krishna, or Rama, Anushilanam, Anu means following in the footsteps of Shilana, the character and conduct of 
Ram Bhaktas of, of like Hanuman. The Bhakti is pleasing to Lord Ramachandra, honoring those persons who are the followers of Ramachandra. Pleasing to Krishna, those who are followers of Krishna. I don't know if you noticed, I noticed, as we were uh, entering and leaving <coughs> the uh, Janardhan temple, there's on this side and there's that side nice images of, of Madhvacharya and right in the middle is a nice big painting or portrayal of Krishna playing his flute. So Madhva, of course, he accepted all of the Vishnu Tattva forms as do we. And the, in his temples, there's Bhu, Varaha, etc., etc., etc. But Krishna is prominent. He's Krishna Bhakta, and we're Krishna Bhaktas, and we're happy being in, in the place where Krishna Bhakti is so prominent. But Ram Bhakti is also very prominent, just like at the temple we went today in the morning. In, in the next session that we hear about Madhvacharya, we, we ended, he made his visit to Upper Badri, he received the mandate from Vedavyas and from Narayana himself, both who reside in Upper Bhadri, to do what he was doing. Before he went, he had this inspiration that it was time to create a commentary on Brahma Sutra. But before making his commentary on Brahma Sutra, sequentially he went to Upper Budri. So now he's got the mandate from both. Veda Vyas and Narayana himself to make such a commentary, spread it far and wide, and correct the misunderstandings, twisted understandings that had been established in relation to the Vedas. So the credit goes to restoring faith and prominence of the Vedas. But now, so when he, he descended from Upper Badri, he went to Badri, we heard, and his disciples were expectantly awaiting, not knowing whether he would ever come back, and he came back. They were very happy. And they started making their way back to Udupi, but we're going to be hearing, he didn't go straight to Udupi. There's a straight line. He went straight line, but he didn't go back straight line. He went along the path of the Ganges. We're going to hear, he went to Navadweep, and in a dream, Chaitanya Mahaprabhu spoke to him, appeared and spoke to him. And then he went further south, and we'll hear some nice experiences when he went further south. But one of the things that happened when he went further south, you'll hear this again tomorrow sometime, so, but this is, no, it's a warm-up. There's, there were deities of Lord Ramachandra that were worshipped in the line of Ikshvaku, in, it goes, we'll hear the whole narration, but they, they, after all that time, they were worshipped by Lord Brahma and, and so forth and so on. Long, very fascinating history. But they were somehow in the care of the kings along the, in Orissa, Gajapatis, the ruling group, the ruling kings, Gajapatis. They had care of the, these original deities of Lord Ramachandra that go back to the creator, Lord Brahma, worshipping them in Brahmaloka. And 
So one of knowing this, Hanuman had been a worshiper of those deities in this sort of succession of their, and his worship of those deities passed several yuga cycles. From the 24th yuga cycle of Vaivasvatamanu to the 28th yuga cycle of Vaivasvatamanu, which is our present yuga cycle. And those deities then were given by Hanuman after so much worship to Bhima. And the occasion when Hanuman gave them to Bhima is found in Mahabharata when Bhima was searching for this certain flower for Draupadi, and, and Draupadi's request and Hanuman was on the path and Hanuman wouldn't move his tail. You know the story. And he said, move your tail. He said, you move my tail. And Bhima couldn't move his tail. It was in, in that exchange, according to this history of Madhvacharya, that the deity, it be, the deity became known as Mula Rama, deities of Ramachandra. This description says that when Dasarath was worshipping, when he had four sons and the eldest son, he named Rama after the deity. Thus, Mula Rama, the deity is the Mula of the name. So anyway, Bhima began worshipping the deities and in the lineage of kings from the, the Pandavas on down, they continued to worship them and at some point they were given in the charge of the Gajapatis. So they're holding these deities that were, and the understanding of Madhvacharya is that there was a mandate that he was to worship them next. So, and he knew where they were. The deities of Ramachandra, Sita Ram, Lakshman, Hanuman. Madhvacharya wanted to worship them, so he sent one of his disciples, Nada Hari Tirtha, who was met during this southern tour as he, before he went back, after his first visit to Uttar Badri and met Vyas, one of the most exalted scholars. I'm, I'm retelling something that we're going to hear more of again. So, But from that person he understood he sent him back. He had become his disciple. They traveled from Godavari all the way back to Udupi. He, he, be, he was trained in Madhva's teachings by Madhva. Madhva sent him somehow get the deity from the Gajapatis. It's a long, nice story. But just a few months before Madhva's departure from this world, Narahari Tirtha received those deities. You can hear later how that happened. It's very interesting. And the deities are being worshipped in Udupi today. Pretty amazing history. Originally, the deities created for the worship of Lord Brahma. And then passed on and passed on. today being worshipped. Very interesting. So Hanuman for, for several, several yuga cycles, he worshipped those deities. He's Ram Bhakta, for sure. But he shared the mercy. That's something that devotees do. He shared the mercy. So that, that the section of Ramayana that is exclusively dedicated to Hanuman is Sundara Kanda. 
So we're going to discuss something from Sundarakanda because it's all about Hanuman. I presented this before multiple times, so it was just, you know, a perfect fit in glorification of Hanuman to discuss the four obstacles that Hanuman meant, met in crossing the ocean to get to Lanka. Four. That's our topic. Here's some of the glories of Hanuman. The greatest devotee of Ram. He introduced Rama to Sugriva. He flew to Lanka. He gave Rama's message to Sita. He warned Ravana. He wholeheartedly accepted the defection of Ibishan into Rama's camp when there was a big hubbub about should he be accepted or not. And he gave his reasons why. One of the main reasons why is Rama's already accepted, so why are we having a discussion? Because he gives shelter to anyone who wants a shelter. That was the essence of his argument. He brought the medicinal herb that gave life back to Lakshman, and he prevented Bharata from immolating himself. What was that? Bharata accepted the rule of the kingdom on behalf of Ram on two conditions. He had the padukas of Ram placed on the throne and he worshipped padukas of Ram on the throne and he ruled on behalf of the padukas of Ram, which means he, fed, he ruled on behalf of Ram. That was one of his conditions. And the other was, if you don't come back, Within 14 years, I'm going to enter fire. So it was almost 14 years, and he was going to keep his word. He was going to enter fire. And Hanuman rescued him. It's really beautiful. Really beautiful. No, 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 don't do that. Ram's on his way. I'm his messenger. He had to persuade Bharata to understand and he, he knew how to explain that he was a messenger just by glorifying Ram in a way that if Ram Bhakta will glorify Ram and he understood, yes. So I won't give up my life. Ram is coming. Be patient. Hanuman, this is from... Um, Madhvacharya, Hanuman was not only on the flag of Arjuna's chariot, he was on the flag. He was present. Hanuman was present with Arjuna. And according to Madhvacharya, the teaching of Krishna to Arjuna wasn't just Krishna's teaching to Arjuna. It's Krishna speaking for the benefit of Hanuman. There's many nice things. Hanuman comes off the flag and, and does things and says things. We'll hear as we go further. Particularly with Jayatirtha. It's a very nice description. Very charming. So, Hanuman is teaching us, aside from his bhakti for Ram, he's teaching us how to overcome obstacles. And because he's the best of the devotees of Ram, doesn't mean he didn't meet obstacles. And we're not the best of devotees of Krishna, so it doesn't mean we're not going to... You ever meet obstacles? Of course. Just live a little while, and there's obstacles. And so there's four categories of obstacles that he meets. Here's a little background from Balakanda in Ramayana. So the demigods approached Vishnu, requesting Vishnu help. 
Ravana, too much. He's a scourge of the universe. Not only on earth, but he, he's a terrorist in the heavenly planets also. We're all afraid of him. Please help Vishnu. So Vishnu replied in a way similar to Krishna's appearance. He replied in such a way Brahma could hear. Brahma conveyed the instructions. Vishnu said, yes, soon I will appear. And please inform the demigods. I would like them to take birth on earth before I appear to assist me in my pastimes. But there were very specific requests that they should appear as offspring through others than the human species. So many of them produced offspring in the monkey species. And one of them was Vayu. And Vayu became the father of Hanuman. Long story of how that happened. We're not going to discuss that. But so from the very beginning, Hanuman, oh, with this instruction of Vishnu, you should empower those, the offspring that you create, to have powers like yours. Mystic powers, trend, you know, you can produce activities and speech of, of mind and eloquence that is equal to yours. So Hanuman's were equal to Vayu's. As you know, one time little Hanuman saw a fruit up in the sky. It wasn't a fruit, it was the sun, but he thought it was a fruit. And so he's reaching for the fruit because he's Hanuman. He could soar through the air to get that fruit, nice big fruit. And Indra was nervous. Indra thought, uh-oh. And so he sent his thunderbolt weapon to check the movement of Hanuman to capture the, moon, the sun. And when the thunderbolt weapon of Indra hit the jaw of Hanuman that stopped his forward movement and when his forward movement was stopped he fell come crashing to the earth again Vayu became very upset and he stopped the movement of air in the whole universe because the universe moves on the strength of air that's a nice you know, Sankhya topic, but won't go there. Prabhupada's statement is, there is this idea of gravity. He said, no, it's Vayu. Planets move and planets stay in their position and planets do what they do. And the movement of Vayu. So he stopped the movement of air in the whole universe. The demigods became choked up. They couldn't breathe what to speak of others. And so they went to Lord Vishnu and said, help. They, they went to Brahma and said, help. So Brahma came with the demigods to the place where Hanuman had fallen to earth and they gave various blessings. This is a painting showing their blessings to Hanuman. They gave him this power, that power, the other power. Vayu was very satisfied. His son is still alive. And now they're honoring him instead of the other. And so Hanuman had all these powers. And with all these powers, he's a little monkey. And he was doing monkey business with all these powers. And one of the things that he did was he was disrupting the yagyas of the sages and their austerities, and pulling their beard, and doing monkey business. So, what to do? So what they did was they gave this curse, or benediction, that he would forget all of his amazing powers. Until that time came when somebody reminded him of his powers. 
until then he became more calm, became a nice vanara. Here's a description of the mischief that he was making. You will forget your great power only when you hear your powers described by another will you again remember them. So that happened. Circumstance happened. Within Valmiki Ramayana, within the Sundara Kanda section of Valmiki Ramayana, we find out that Hanuman received his education from Surya Dev, from the Sun God. And it's confirmed just before Hanuman made his leap to Lanka, he's offering his prayers to Surya Dev because Surya Dev was his guru. Before beginning, he was seeking the blessings of Surya Dev. So after Sita was kidnapped, many things happened. One of the things that happened was the search for where did Sita go? So Sugriva had massive numbers of followers and Sugriva sent them in the four directions searching for Sita. And one of the persons that went in the southern direction was Hanuman. And when they reached the shore at the southern tip of India and they couldn't find Sita, then Angada decided if we go back and tell Sugriva we couldn't find her, who knows what he might do. He's a wild man. He might just kill us. So rather than have him kill us, let us just fast till death right here. And he did. He was planning. He laid down by the side of the ocean with the plan, every intention of giving up his life, fasting till death. And all the other Vanras, except Hanuman, followed suit. And then came this nice incident where Sampati, who was Jatayu's brother, being a vulture, when he saw all these Vanras just lying, ready to give up their life, he was in bliss, vulture bliss. My meal. And I didn't even have to go anywhere because he couldn't go anywhere because his wings had been singed by the sun. It's a long story of how that happened. When he spread his wings to protect Jatayu when they were flying so high in the sky, he thought his brother, younger brother Jatayu, was going to be singed by the light and heat of the sun. And so he spread his wings and they burned and he came crashing down. And since that time he couldn't fly. So he saw all these Vanras fasting until death. And so, because he couldn't fly, he jumped down and jumped down and jumped down, getting closer to a place where he could have a feast, a Vanara feast. You know the story. There's so many details I'm leaving out because of time and circumstance. So, he wanted to know who these people are. And they wanted to know who he was. Because when he was getting closer, he heard them discussing about Jatayu. And he wanted to know, what do you know about Jatayu? So they said, here's how we know Jatayu. Here's what we, Jatayu gave up his life. In service to Ram. To, to try to regain Sita when Sita was being kidnapped. They told their story and he told his story of his relationship with Jatayu and said, because he's my younger brother, 
can you take me by the side of the sea and I can perform oblations for the final rites of the parted soul of my brother. So they did that. And here's Hanuman and Jambavan and many others. And when they told Sampati their story, he had lost his ability to fly, but he didn't lose his ability to see. And as it is known, vultures can see for a long distance. And he looked across the sea and he saw where Sita was. And then they decided, oh, this is really good. Now we can let Ram know we know where Sita is. But they wanted to verify, not just take Sampati's word for it. And so they started considering how to get all the, how far away is it? 100 Yojanas, which is 800 miles. So big discussion back and forth, back and forth amongst the Varanas, who can jump what distance? This Varana said they can jump this distance and that one said that distance. And Angada said I could jump, but he couldn't jump back. Fortunately, there was one in that assembly that knew of Hanuman's powers. There you see him sitting right in the middle of this painting, and that's Jambavan. So Jambavan approached Hanuman and said, Hanuman, you can do it. And he reminded Hanuman of his powers. And when he reminded Hanuman of his powers, his remembrance of his forgotten abilities came back. Because the Brahmana's utterance you won't remember until someone reminds you. So Jambavan just reminded him, you can do it, Hanuman. Amongst all of us here, you're capable. And Hanuman, starting to remember, his body got bigger and bigger and bigger, getting ready to leap across the ocean. And this is a very beautiful section. It's literally where the Kishkindakanda section of Ramayana ends and the Sundarakanda section begins. One of the most celebrated commentators in the Sri Sampradaya on the topic of Ramayana, he, his name is Govindaraj. And Govindaraj, in his commentary, much like it is said about the Bhagavatam from Padma Purana, Govindaraj said that the Ramayana can or is to be considered the form of Lord Ramachandra himself, starting with his feet and moving through the different khandas, different sections. So in the Sundara Khanda, this is the Sundara feature of the form of Lord Ramachandra. So it's a very celebrated section. So here's the seven sections. So the section begins, Sundra Khanda begins with Hanuman offering his prayers to the sun god before he does anything. He seeks the blessings of his guru. That's a nice lesson in, in itself. And to his father, Vayu, he's seeking their blessings. It's a nice section, nice prayers, very instructive. And now he's at the top of Mahendra Mountain preparing himself. And there's really long and very beautiful descriptions before you begin some important service on behalf of the Supreme Lord with the blessings of your guru and your those who are your superiors. Here's from Valmiki Ramayana. Hanuman expanded his body to gigantic proportions. Moreover, while grabbing onto the mountain with his hands and feet, he inadvertently crushed many deer underfoot. Pausing for several moments, Hanuman concentrated composing his mind in preparation for the great leap. Mind comes before the action. 
Because of the weight of his huge body, the entire mountain began to shake. Thus large snakes, while vomiting fire from their mouths, bit into the rocks, causing them to split into thousands of flaming fragments. It's like a movie. The Vidyadharas flew up into the sky to witness the spectacular jump. Thereafter, Hanuman crouched down, summoning all his energy, and the mountain peak began to crumble as spurts of water gushed forth from the immense pressure Gandharva couples that had been sporting in the heavenly region along with numerous rishis that resided there, quickly fled the mountain out of fear. Hanuman then declared to the monkeys, either I shall bring back Sita, or I shall uproot the entire city of Lanka, along with Ravana. Then comes the celebrated verse. Many of you know the verse, or at least know of the verse. Hanuman, who raised his head and neck, intending to cross the formidable ocean, which none else could accomplish, looked like a leading bull. And he prepared himself, and other verses, like an arrow shot from the bow of Ram. He soared through the air. Hanuman drew in his breath, tensed his muscles. All of a sudden, he sprang into the air. Here it is, like an arrow shot from the bow of Lord Ram. Due to the force of Hanuman's jump, all the trees on the peak of Mount Mahendra were uprooted and thrown into the sky. In reply to their exclamations of wonder, Hanuman soared like a huge cloud and stretched out his tail. So picture that in your mind. We're going to see some paintings. Like an arrow from the bow of Ram being shot. As Hanuman sailed through the heavens, the uprooted trees followed in his wake and then plummeted into the ocean. Simultaneously, various colored flowers that were blown from the branches of the trees fluttered down and scattered over the surface of the water, creating a particularly beautiful sight. So this is one of the many renderings. This is Hanuman making his leap from Mahendra mountain. And there's the demigods showering flowers on Hanuman. This is an old painting. There's Jambavan watching and the other Angada and others watching. Here's with his tail stretched out, leaping across the ocean. Big roar. May you be successful. So it's a big event. Hanuman's leap across the ocean. But even if you're Hanuman, there's obstacles. So he was flying at great heights, at great speed. And then suddenly there was an obstacle that rose from the sea. The first of the four obstacles that he met was Mainaka Mountain. So Mainaka, who was Mainaka? Mainaka was a personified mountain that during Satya Yuga, so this is the Yuga following Satya Yuga, but during Satya Yuga, mountains were able to fly. They had wings. Now that's just a story, right? It's a, it's a myth. It's not true. It's not true that mountains could fly. It's true, mountains could fly. And when the mountains flew, they would come in for a landing somewhere. And when they came in for a landing, they would crush whatever was in their way. The, the example is given that when an elephant walks, it's not intending to hurt anyone, but 
small animals and whatever got, was underneath their big hooves of an elephant would get crushed. So living entities lodged a complaint with the demigods, do something. These flying mountains are crushing so many of us. So Indra said, I'll help. So what did Indra do to help is he had a thunderbolt weapon and with his thunderbolt weapon, he was cutting off the wings of the mountains that flew. And when it came to Mainaka, fortunately for Mainaka, there was a friendship between Mainaka and Vayu. So Vayu helped him by force of wind blew Mainaka into the sea. And as Mainaka went into the sea, the thunderbolt weapon of Indra couldn't cut off his wings. So he still had his wings. So Vayu had done some nice service for Mainaka. And Mainaka wanted to repay that kindness that Vayu had done. There's an important verse coming up, and that is, Mainaka says that it's Sanatan Dharma when you receive an act of kindness from someone to offer, do something in return. Gratitude. It's a Sanatan Dharma principle. And the opposite is Adharma. So knowing that, Sumudra, the lord of the sea, also approached Mainaka because the sea personified had received some service from an ancestor of Lord Ramachandra. Sagara, a king in the line of Ikshvaku, had done some service for Samudra. One of the services of Samudra, one of the services of Samudra was that Sagra expanded the oceans in search for the horse that from an ancestor in the Ikshvaku line. So he, Samudra, put two and two together and he was good math, he came up with four. I can reciprocate with the kindness that an ancestor Ramchandra did by doing a service for one of his devotees. Hanuman being one of his devotees, I can do some service to reciprocate with an ancestor of Ram by doing an act of kindness. So he went to Mainaka and said, I received some kindness, you've received some kindness because Vayu saved your life, or saved your wings. So here's an opportunity. Can you rise from the bottom of the sea and make an arrangement for a Hanuman who's got a long journey ahead of him and just pro provide him a nice place to rest and some fruits and some nice edibles and he can have a little snack on the way. So Mainaka was very happy. So from the sea, Mainaka emerged with a great roar. Seawater falling with a crash on all sides. The golden peaked mountain rose swiftly, shining beautifully like many suns, with Nagas and Kinneras sporting on its slopes. <clears throat> and in Valmiki Ramayana, in Sundarakanda, there's this nice verse. Krite cha pratikartavyam esha dharma sanatana. Translated, one should acknowledge a favor and try to pay it back. This is sanatana dharma. It's a lesson of life that dharmic people live by. I mean, even people that don't know this verse from Ramayana, they try to live by. You, when you receive kindness from another, you feel gratitude. And 
that feeling of gratitude and doing something arising from that feeling of gratitude is dharma. My Naka expressed this principle to Hanuman, knowing that Hanuman was dharmic and would reciprocate. However, Hanuman has a mission. And he doesn't want to stop. Have you ever been asked to do something when you're in the middle of something else? Like stop what your something else is and do this thing that I want you to do? It happens all the time. <laughs> what do you do? Well, here's what you do if you're Hanuman. So here's this, what I've already described. Augusta Rishi had dried up the ocean. He had become angry, and he dried up the ocean. It's a long, it's, it's a nice story. And Sagra, knowing that he had done that, he refilled the ocean. Here's from Mahabharata. It's, it's the flip side. The flip side says, when Lakshmana was approaching Sugriva, saying, you received this favor from Ramachandra and you're doing nothing? This is the opposite of dharma. It's adharma. There's kritagya, that's ungrateful person, kritagya, and krita, so acknowledging a kindness received and not acknowledging a kindness received. Being grateful and being ungrateful, they're, they're opposites. He quoted Lord Brahma saying, one should become angry when seeing an ungrateful person. Here's the translation. Atonements have been prescribed as beneficial for one who kills a Brahmana, who drinks liquor, who commits theft, and one who violates a sacred vow, but not one who is ungrateful. There's no atonement for being ungrateful. So, Ramayana is saying it, Mahabharata is saying it, Panchatatra is saying it was Panchatatra. We have some children here. You, you, you familiar with Panchatatra? Panchatatra is a children's storybook where through activities of animals, children are learning values. And there's a, a nice story of the ungrateful man. And he has to suffer enormously simply on that one principle of being ungrateful. I'm not going to narrate the story. But it's the same phrase, krita gya, krita gye. Don't be ungrateful. Be grateful. And grateful is demonstrated by a kindness that you do in reciprocation for the kindness because you're feeling grateful. Now, gratitude is not love. It's duty. Bhakti Thakur makes a very clear distinction. So I'll repeat it. Duty is not the same as love. Love is a spontaneous emotion. Gratitude is just, it's just proper conduct. You feel something, you do something. So bhakti, in the higher stages, is executed from the platform of love. You do not because you're supposed to do. I mean, you, so the platform of regulative bhakti is you do because you're supposed to do. You don't do what you're not supposed to do because you're not supposed to do. You know, like don't steal. Don't lie, etc., etc. Why? Because you're not. Because good people don't lie, good people don't steal, good people don't do things you're not supposed to do. It's just duty. It's mode of goodness, and then transcendence is beyond duty. Bhakti is transcendental when properly. So if there's regulated part of bhakti. And there's a spontaneous part of bhakti, which is where love enters one's heart. That's Chaitanya Mahaprabhu's teaching or Rupa Goswami's teaching. Raga Bhakti is the followers of 
Chaitanya Mahaprabhu follow Raga Bhakti. But here, coming back down, it's just dharma. It's a duty. So Mainaka is just doing a duty. And Hanuman is, uh, is dharmic. So what is he going to do? So Mainaka rose and there's his wings. And Hanuman is being asked, please take some rest. Reci please reciprocate. Allow might me to do a little service. But Hanuman has a mission. But he's dharmic, so he can't not, he can't say, sorry, Charlie. <laughs> so, Mainaka appeared in, in human form on top of the mountain, making this request of Hanuman. So what did Hanuman do? This is a mode of goodness. Something may arise. The lesson is, stepping back from the story, something may arise in your life that's the result of past piety. And some good fortune may come in your life that may arise from past, 40, from past piety. Wealth may come your way. Honor or praise may come your way. Gratitude, excuse me, honors and something may come your way. Don't indulge. But what do you do if you don't indulge? You honor it. It's some kindness has come. In this case, very significant. It's not something that Hanuman had done. It's something that his father did. And it's not something that Hanuman did. It's something that the person who he's in the service of did. Or the ancestor of the person who he's in the service of did. The, the, uh, some honorifics are going to him. Some kindness, some facility is coming his way. It may happen, in your, it may happen the opposite. Misfortune may come. You don't even know why that misfortune is coming. Or good fortune may come. And you don't know exactly why that... So what, what to do when good fortune comes? When someone is expressing in the mode of goodness something, don't indulge. Especially if you have a higher purpose. Don't be neglectful of culture and respect of that person that wants to offer something. Don't disrespect them or ignore them. Sometimes devotees do that. Here's what not to do. Someone says, oh, Prabhu, something, something. And then the devotee goes, no, 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 no. Don't do that. You don't say yes, 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 either. So what do you do? You have culture, this Hanuman is teaching us, what does a cultured person do? He descended, first he expressed why. I made a vow to both Sugriva and Ramachandra, and I have to complete that vow. So I must finish it, and I have to finish it before the day ends. Why do I have to finish it before the day ends? Because he's going to a place where there's rakshasas. And what happens at night for rakshasas? Their strength increases. So I can't stop. You want me to stop, but I can't. So please accept the fact that I can't, accept the kindness that you want to extend, but this much. He descended and he touched Mainaka in, in acknowledgement of the kindness that was extended by Mainaka without indulging in the entitlement. That this is an obstacle in bhakti. The fruits of your past piety or something or something, and it can result in complacency in bhakti. Now I, I'm getting something I deserve. Let me enjoy this for a while at least. Complacency withers our enthusiasm. And there can be various kinds of distraction. That is, the happiness that comes from the mode of goodness, or indulging in the knowledge that comes from the mode of goodness, or material opulence, even if it's not generated from you, just from others. 
in the family line in which you come or something or something. We become lazy. It's possible to become lazy and complacent. So our thought process is, I have a purpose in life. If you don't have a purpose in life, it's easy to indulge. If you have a purpose in life, while maintaining culture, being respectful to others, all the while, stay focused on your mission in life. Thank you for this kind offer, but I must continue. Okay, so that's... Here's a nice example from Brihat Bhagavatamrita on the same principle. The painting shown on the screen is Gopa Kumar as a young cowherd boy, a Gopa Kumar. He receives mantra from his guru. And from that mantra that he received from his guru, he got great power and strength and capacity to do amazing most amazing things. But as those most amazing things were just being presented, it's not even that he wanted, I want something amazing, and so he got something amazing. But they were happening, and what, how to respond to that amazing? He stayed focused on the mission. And what was the mission? The mission was to acknowledge the fullness of what he had received from his guru. So how could he receive the fullness of this mantra that he received, well, he got distracted and complacent. Many things happened. They were inviting him along the way in different realms of higher planetary systems to stay and enjoy what their planetary system had to offer. This is from Sanatana Goswami's commentary. Wanting to avoid being ungrateful, there's the term again, Gopa Kumar never stopped chanting. He might justify abandoning the mantra only after attaining its final goal. If he were to stop chanting before then, he would not discover the mantra's full benefits. Correct? Thus, to stop the chanting prematurely would amount to ingratitude. For without having bothered to receive all the mantra's benefits, how could he properly acknowledge them? Now that's transcendental intelligence. So devotees, we've all received a mantra, Hare Krishna Maha Mantra, and there's lots and lots and lots of benefit to be derived. Stay with it. Receive the fullness of the benefits so that you can actually and properly acknowledge what the gift is that we have received. The mantra. So, that's what Hanuman did with this mode of goodness obstacle, or the fruit of the mode of goodness obstacle. It's, dis it's discussed in Madhurya Kandambani. The language is different, the principle is the same. One of the obstacles in the process of bhakti, and specifically even the process of chanting, one of the obstacles is being the enjoyer of the fruits of pa past piety. It's an obstacle. It's not the fruits of piety is an obstacle. It's trying to be thinking of oneself as meant to be the enjoyer of. We're not meant to be the enjoyer of. We're meant to be servants. That's who we are. And to realize who you are, you have to let go of that mentality that you know, I'm entitled to be the enjoyer. And there's many, 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 too many manifestations of that. Have you noticed, I've noticed, I'm sure many of you have noticed, look around the room and how many non- Non-resident Indians are there. In the Hare Krishna movement, when it began, it was a different makeup of the constituency. And those that are from the Indian diaspora, from the Indian background, many have 
enormous piety, naturally so, and with that enormous piety, they've gotten very substantial education because it's, it's natural. It, it's part of the fruits of piety. Shruta, good education. So now, for me, I see the entitlement of those who have good education feeling a sense of entitlement that I'm entitled to a certain amount of something. And then you get a bunch of those people together and what do you get? You get a bunch of people thinking they're entitled and they start getting in quarrels with one another over territory of entitlement. Have you seen it? Anyone that's been around the block a few years knows it's, it's, it's a problem. And then there's groups that form and there's groupism. It can be a guru groupism or whatever it is, groupism. My group and your group and groupism. And it's not nice. It's a problem. So where does it arise from? This is where it arises from. It's an obstacle on the path of bhakti. There's an obstacle. There's a mission that Hanuman has. Find Sita. There's a mission that we have. Awaken pure bhakti. And there's obstacles in the form of the fruits of past piety. And then becoming the enjoyers of the fruits of past piety. So many different permutations and combinations and arrangements. Let go of that. Stay focused on the mission. Find Sita, for that's Hanuman's mission. And ours is achieve pure bhakti. Not achieve a position or acknowledgement or entitlement to something, something, something. Leave that. Not easy to leave it. It kind of sticks. I find it a big obstacle in the Hare Krishna movement today. So beware, because many of you are well-educated and have piety. Whatever generation you are, it's there with you. Beware. Big problem. So that's the first obstacle that he confronts. So he displayed his character to all these, the demigods that were observing, and then comes after the test of his character, the test of his competence. Now, the demigods, Gandharvas, Indra, and the demigods, approach Surasa, who's Surasa. She's shown in the painting at the bottom. She's the mother of the Nagas, the mother of the Nagas, or the queen of the Nagas. And they gave her an assignment. We want to see the strength of competence because as Hanuman gets closer to finding Sita, he's going to meet bigger obstacles than just crossing the ocean. So test his competence. So the idea in Shurasa's testing his competence was she rose from the sea in, in service to Indra and the demigods and the rishis. And she opened her mouth really wide, wanting Hanuman to show his power and his intelligence. The phrase that's used is upayena, and his power. So she rose from the sea, assumed a huge form disfigured, looking, looked like a rakshasi, as big as a mountain, and opened her mouth wide. Here's a little etymology of her name. Su Rasa implies tasteful distractions which demigods place on the path of a sincere spiritual aspirant. There's your internal, and then there's sensual enjoyments which have a devouring tendency. This is another meaning. Increasing of one's material desires. So the motivation to do better 
is challenged, do better in the spiritual sense, in the bhakti sense. It's a mode of passion. The first one was a mode of goodness. Next is a mode of passion obstacle. Desires increase. And with desires increase, you have to have greater effort. And there's no limit to effort making if you're very fixed on getting what you want. So there she is. And she declares to Hanuman, Brahma has given me a boon that none who come before me can escape being eaten. So what's he going to do? Well, Hanuman has a power. He became bigger and bigger and bigger. And as he became bigger and bigger, her jaw became bigger and bigger. And really big, 20 miles. 20 miles is a big distance. He became really big. And she became bigger than his body was big. And after he, she became so big, suddenly he became very small and entered her mouth and came out her ear saying, the boon of Brahma has been fulfilled. You, you, you ate me. And then I left your body with a small little Hanuman coming out your ear. Specifically, Ramayana said all the while, he wasn't fearful, he didn't get angry, he didn't start calling her names or anything like that, or feel something negative. He was smiling. His countenance didn't change, his mood didn't change, because he's, why? Because he's in the mood of service. Now he has powers which we don't have. We can't become big and get in real small. And we don't have Anima and Magima City. We don't have those cities. He did. But he knew how to use them too in service of Ramachandra. So here's a nice painting. He got really small. He entered her mouth. And then there you see on the right side, he left her ear. And he said, I have honored Brahma's boon, now let me pass and fulfill my mission. I wish you well. The sages, Indra, the demigods were all satisfied. He showed his prowess, that is to say, further along the path of carrying out your service, or my service, or Hanuman's service, there's going to be challenges. And sometimes the, the higher entities produce obstacles to test your ability to continue on with your mission, your higher purpose. Or a lesson is, passion is countered by humility. So, she went back. The Naga goddess assumed her original form, and she praised Hanuman, blessing him, be successful. And he was successful. In Valmiki Ramayana, the Naga goddess, this is a detail, she's one of ten daughters born of Kashyapa Muni by his wife Krodash, Krodha Vasha. Prota Vasha was one of Kashyapa Muni's wives and also the, one of the daughters of Daksha. All of this is described in Aranyakanda. And we're running out of time. We've only covered two. So I'm just going to fast forward a bit. This gives some details of scriptural references showing the second obstacle, the obstacle of passion and Hanuman's solution was humility. Of course, he used his power. He called upon his intelligence of super soul, how to deal with the obstacle. 1010 10 Bhagavad Gita, Dadami Bodhi Yogam Tam. His focus was, I, I, I have to find Sita and reassure Sita, Ram will come and redeem you. 
For that purpose he used his strength, not arising from combat or false ego. That's what com that's what commonly people do. <laughs> Whatever abilities they have, they as uh, arising from a motive of false ego. But a pure devotee doesn't have that obstacle, difficulty. Okay. There's a nice example in our Gaudiya tradition where Rupa Goswami was confronted by a scholar, a traveling scholar, and he wanted to debate with him. And Rupa Goswami said, oh, you're such an eminent scholar. How could I debate with you? I'll concede defeat. And the scholar said, oh, very good. Signed this document says you've been defeated by me. Rupa Goswami immediately signed because he had no interest and no business in wrangling with a wrangling scholar. He could defeat him, but he had no interest. So here, in connection with this second challenge, here's something that you may have heard before. Um, it, the, the, the source of this something you may have heard before is from a Lutheran theologian, gives the dates of his life. It's a prayer to God Please grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Now, I spoke about this in a university setting one time, and somebody stopped me and raised their hand and said, for systems for getting people on the other side of addiction, this is one of their slogans, Please give me the serenity to accept the things I can't change, the courage to change the things I can, and the wisdom to know the difference. You know, Alcoholics Anonymous, triple A, double A. It's their slogan. It's an addiction. Anyway, life has its obstacles, and some obstacles you can change. Some obstacles you can't change, and to be accepting of the ones you can't change. There's more to be said on this, but we have to move on. Much more. I'll say one more. One of my favorite reference sources is Viktor Frankl. Now, some of you in the room may know who is Viktor Frankl, and most of you probably don't, but he's a good person to learns lessons from. Viktor Frankl wrote a book in 1946 called Man's Search for Meaning. He wrote the book just after World War II, 1946. It's a little skinny book that's been reprinted 19 times because it's very powerful and it's very skinny. It's really easy, really well written and easy to read. And in it, there's lots of wisdom. And one of the wisdoms is something like this. What man needs, there's many sayings. You can look it up later on Google and you get tons of stuff. Or the book is a good book. Man's Search for Meaning. What man needs is not release a tensionless state where there's release from all of obstacles because... Some obstacles aren't going to change. In his case, he was a Jewish man in a Nazi concentration camp. He couldn't change the circumstance. But he could change his consciousness. Rather than being fearful or feeling oppressed or feeling other negative emotions, he was fixed on his purpose. A purpose that was awaiting for him to fulfill that purpose was how to help people deal with circumstances of life. There's nothing they can do about the circumstance. And one of his lessons is have a higher purpose. In Hanuman's case, his higher purpose was given to him by Sugriva and Ram. Find Sita. Reassure Sita. We're going to rescue her. That was his mission. It fixed. We may not have such, such an explicit mission. Ram telling you 
do this. But each of us should, you say, attain the state of pure bhakti. Not mixed, but pure bhakti. Attain the state of pure bhakti. That's Rupa Goswami's mandate. It's what bhakti is. It's pure. Attain it. Dedicate your life to attain it. Not start there and get distracted and go off in la-la land and you're doing something else besides striving for pure bhakti. How do you stay fixed? When you stay fixed, there's strength that comes from Krishna. And without that being fixed in your mission, you won't have strength. Same kind of strength. Some passion strength maybe, but not transcendental strength. It's a lesson. Right within Hanuman's crossing the ocean. So here's test number three. It's not mode of goodness test, mode of passion test. Here's the mode of ignorance test. She's a wicked person. She's a demoness. And here's the section of Sundara Kanda where it's described. She had a power to stop the movement of others by capturing their shadow. So Hanuman was soaring high in the sky. So high in the sky, he was in, in the region where the Siddhas and Charanas travel. That's really high. Where do Siddhas and Charanas travel? Bhuvar Loka, that's where they travel. He was really high, but he was casting a shadow and she stopped his shadow. Before he left, going way back in Kishkindakanda, before he left the side of Sugriva, Sugriva warned him, you're going in the southerly direction. Beware of this personality. Her name was given a different name in that place. Angaraka means very famous. Sugriva warned Hanuman. Watch out from Angaraka. She's infamous, not just fam famous. So here she is. She's in the sea, and she's not only stopping the movement of Hanuman, but she's causing Hanuman to descend. And he's going down and down and down and down. Hanuman again enlarged his body size. She enlarged her mouth size. And then he entered her mouth like hard, like a diamond. He, there wasn't any discussion between them. This is the mode of ignorance obstacle. No discussion. He entered her mouth and he ripped apart her, her internal organs. Her heart cleft in two and burst out from her chest. And she went crushing back into the sea. So there's a nice lesson of how to deal with mode of ignorance obstacles. No negotiating, no messing. When the devatas saw how Simica was dealt with, well done, well done. Hanuman was created by Lord Brahma for the purpose of killing this terrible demon, Simica. She's the personification of prohibitions to bhakti or vikarmic activities, all resting upon envy. She was envious. You can't pass. This is my territory. This is commentary. Chaya grahi is that power where she could capture her prey by grabbing the shadow of her prey. And so similarly envious people, they don't show themselves in secretive ways, clandestine ways. They sneak around and they don't confront the person, but they cause chaos for the person. Maybe you know some people like that. I know some people like that. She is the obstacle of the mode of ignorance. And there wasn't any negotiation with her. She he just did what was necessary. Here's the Padma Purana verse that's in this connection. You know the verse? Smarthavyasatatam vishnur 
Vismartavyo Najatuchit Sarva Vidhi Nasedhasur Etayor Eva Kinkara the Kinkara all Vidhis and Nishedas, the do's and don'ts are Kinkaras or servants of this one principle. What's the one principle? Always remember Krishna, never forget Krishna. Simika was an obstacle that was preventing in a violent way, preventing his mission. So he didn't forget his mission, he didn't forget the purposes of his mission, the personality who was to be pleased by his mission, and he overcame the obstacle. I'm just going to move along to, to the fourth because of time. The fourth obstacle is Lankini. There's Hanuman looking pretty small compared to Lankini, who looks pretty big. As he was entering the city, it's a full moon night, and Rakshasis and Rakshasas become very powerful. And she presented herself before Hanuman and identified herself. She's the presiding deity of Lanka. And Lanka is like a, a place of sinful activity. And she told them to stop, and she not only told them to stop, but she immediately struck Hanuman with her hand. So now what's Hanuman going to do? He wasn't moved by her striking of her hand. He didn't get angry and, you know, smash her. He could have. But with his fist, he hit her enough that she was knocked over. And when she was knocked over, the demon goddess fell prostrate to the ground. When she fell prostrate to the ground, shortly after she recovered, and she begged Hanuman to spare her life. She understood how powerful was Hanuman. And then she recalled this story or this incident that happened long, long ago when Brahma had told her that when a monkey comes and overpowers you, that will be the sign that the whole Rakshasa race was ending. She remembered that statement of Brahma. She knew what was coming. And she got out of his way. She told him, you proceed. And she disappeared. Now when she disappeared, what did she do? She didn't just like poof, disappear. She went back and informed her boss or her master, Ravana. You know what happened? Here's what happened. And this is what it means. The Rakrasa race is finished, according to the sign of Brahma. So this Lankini, this is the bodily conception of life. So she introduced herself as the protectress or the goddess guarding the whole city of Lanka. Here it is from Sundarakanda. Nagari Svena Rupena Dardasha Pavanatmajam Aham. I'm this body, and the, the place that I'm protecting is mine. I and mine. Consciousness. False ego. And I'm the doer. In obedience to the orders of the great demon king Ravana. I am protecting this unassailable city, the doer. She's, she's, it's a good package. I, mine, and I'm the doer. This is, Lankini is representing the unwillingness of a conditioned soul to receive a saintly person. Hanuman is that saintly person. And defensiveness and suspicion was the intention of this other person. We're almost done. I'm just think, I think I'm just going to end here. Obstacles in life. Now, embedded in, as a thread, visible or not visible, there's a thread that runs through Ramayana, and many, many 
not just one, many lessons of life are un to be understood through the narration of Puranas and Itihasas. It's not just a storytelling like the children's you know, story of how to, how, how to not be ungrateful. It's th but it's there because it's Dharma. Be, be grateful. But don't be complacent and enjoyer of the fruits of your pie and so forth and so on. So there's many lessons within Puranic stories and through the assistance of our great acharyas, we can learn important lessons of life and not have to learn the hard way by knocks in the head. Those are two ways. You, by good instruction or getting knocks in the head. Which way would you rather? So it's nice to not, because there's going to be knocks in the head anyways. Learn the hard way. But it's nice to learn, and then once you've learned, then follow the example of those who are giving, who have that learning and can impart that learning to us, to you and to others and those dear to you. There's lessons and how to learn those lessons. So they're there within the, the thread of Hanuman's pastimes here. There's just crossing the sea. That's just one small episode, important, but small episode in the whole of Sundarakanda. So it's wonderful literature to teach us lessons of life. So I think I'm going to end. You want to make announcements already? Or should I take questions? I can't hear you. I can't hear you. What? I can't hear you. Okay, so let's do the important announcements. Whatever you want me to do, I'm your servant. Questions? Comments or questions? You're on. Hare Krishna Maharaj. Uh, uh, Maharaj, we heard about the gratitude. You were uh, talking about the gratitude. If uh, we get something from someone, we should be grateful. Yes. Uh, Maharaj, I was just reflecting it in my life uh, because there were uh, certain incidences in my childhood where, uh, where I received a lot from my teachers. But... but? But at the same time, there were a lot of hurts which I received from them as well. Yeah. So, uh, one part of my heart is grateful to them, but the major part is overcovered by the hurts which I have. So, more or less, when I think, so I do have a lot of complaints for them rather than, you know, gratitude part is very less. So, uh, Maharaj, I was thinking like, in that case, what should be my approach? Like how You mean you're human? You mean to say you're human? So here's, along with gratitude, there's another nice lesson in life. You can give it two different terms. One is forgiveness. Another word is acceptance. You know, different situations require, or, or what's called for is forgiveness. In other situations, acceptance. It's just, it is what it is. Your business, 
You're less than perfect. Well, let's just ask it as a, are you less than perfect? Do you sometimes do something that others perceive as being hurtful? Maybe not your intention, but it may be perceived that way. It just comes across to others that you're being hurtful. And it may happen more than once, and they carry that grudge or impression that says, while she's this, she's that. No, you're not responsible for how others feel, but you're responsible for you. So that, and that's your question. So forgiveness or acceptance. Now part of acceptance is if someone has factually, not just per perception wise, but factually done something hurtful, you can acknowledge it. That's the acceptance part. It was hurtful. But in, in the heart of the heart of all living beings, they're parts of Krishna. Let me honor that. And the kindness that I received, let me honor that. And let me do something in relation to that kindness received. And then the other stuff, it's not like you just close your eyes and pretend it's not there. But where, 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 where do you place it? Forgiveness. Just like I, if I would like others to forgive me, I'm speaking personally, for my shortcomings. Do I have shortcomings? Abundant. And whether I say it to a person who feels, you know what? You've got shortcomings, man. And they may not say it like that or say it at all. But I, you know, I, I acknowledge that I have my shortcomings, as do you. And those shortcomings may have caused some hurt to uh, others. So you would like to be forgiven. Forgive them. You know, do unto others as you would have others do unto you. You know that one. It's called the golden rule, and it's in all scriptures of the world. It's in all scriptures of the world. It's in all scriptures of the world. The golden rule. The language is different. The principle is the same. So forgive. Because you would like to be forgiven. So that's a mode of goodness response. These are, I'm suggesting, it's a mode of goodness response to rather than feeling victim. by the hurt that, was, that you're feeling from something that legitimately was hurtful. Or at least I perceive it as hurtful. No, no, it wasn't just perceived, it was really hurtful. Anyway, whether it was perceived or real, do unto others. And what, what will happen for you, not only your heart will not become cluttered with that feeling of hurt, it'll dissipate, but you'll be an agent for helping that person or others who you contact of lifting them up from their negative emotions by being, not just being, you know, the, the power of positive thinking kind of thing, but being on the spiritual platform. Starting with Dharma and then going to the platform of love. That's an option for you. Easier said than done, right? Is it possible? Not only possible, many people do it. So one of the things that may help you do it is to be in the association of those who do it or those who, are, who know you very well and they can hold you by the hand except this is the package of you. You're feeling this and you're feeling that. Let me help you accepting who you are let me help you get on the other side of the hurt. Like a mentor, or a counselor, or a guide, or a good friend. A good friend. So that's something you can also do. Find a good friend who understands these principles of transcendence and can help you give strength beyond your strength to do which you're maybe you know, feeling stuck right now in that space that's not a, a pleasant space. Is it available? It's available. That's what Sadhu Sangha is meant for. 
It, it, it's, it's powerful and it works. Are you eligible? You're eligible. Find such a friend that's wise and kind, accepts you for who you are, and helps you to grow. It's doable. Find good friends. Find at least one good friend. Or a guide or a mentor or someone. Very capable person. More than one is fine too. So I saw some hands in the front. Do we have a microphone in the front? Hare Krishna Maharaj. Um, I, I had a, a, a thought from today's class and a question from a previous class. So um, I was wondering if you could elaborate on uh, misconceptions, uh, misconceptions about the self affecting our ability to, or even misdirect, our ability to have gratitude or even misdirected gratitude. So, basically, I was thinking the bodily conception of life um, that can affect our, like maybe we won't even feel grateful for certain things or we may feel grateful. You speak real fast, which is nice, <laughs> but my hearing doesn't match your speed of speaking. Can you speak slower? Try. Okay. Um, I, I, was, I was thinking about what you were saying about bodily conception of life, like yes. Lankini, yes. Um, and yes. how, and I was also thinking about what you were saying about having gratitude. Yes. And how a bodily conception of life. Blocks it. Huh? It blocks gratitude. Yes, and even misdirects, could, could even misdirect, block or misdirect. So I was hoping maybe you could... I, don't know. I mean, I, I can think of so many places where I'm like, oh, thank you, Krishna, for things that are like irrelevant in the long run. So I was... Well, I'm not sure what you're looking for. I think I understand what your question is, but I'm not sure what you're looking for. Meaning, one of the best, I'm, I'm a, a follower of Bhakti Vinod Thakur's principle of little steps. You know that one. Bhakti Vinod Thakur teaches progress is a series of small steps in the right direction. You've heard me say that hundreds of times. So that's my answer to your question. You don't have to become, hit a home run or become perfect or like the discussion that I was sharing about the peach tree. Be patient with yourself and in course of time, just continue to follow and slowly, slowly, in principle, if you become principle-centered in your life, not just value-centered, but principle-centered with a spiritual objective, then going beyond the bodily conception and the other types of obstacles that block gratitude and the flow of gratitude that brings gratitude to the position of love, just little steps no, put in your GPS what the destination is and stay with it. The goal is Krishna's happiness. And Krishna's happiness results in our happiness. And our happiness means overcoming these petty things. Or the, the obstacle things, the, the bodily conception things that make everything messy and uncomfortable for us and for those around us. So, I don't want to be a cause of discomfort for others, nor anyway. So, I want a spiritual destination in my life. The trajectory of my life should go in that direction. And then we follow exemplary persons. So, you have, not, you know, find some, you have exemplary persons in your life. 
I know that you know that you have exemplary persons in your life. So follow and keep close association, warm, affectionate association for those who are really good examples in your life. Keep those relationships warm and vibrant and serve those persons sincerely and slowly the little steps in the right direction. Now, the, the path to perfection takes a while. Like the peach tree example. Be patient. Be kind to yourself by following, you know, the exemplary persons and serving them with faith that you're, by doing that, Krishna will be pleased and that's the goal. And the more the awakening of the consciousness that Krishna is to be pleased, you're closer to the goal. And internally, the obstacles are being removed just by that. Incrementally. Don't be complacent. Because that's not going to help. Years will pass by and you're... You know, you may feel I'm in the same position or I've even gone back from where I initially in, in Krishna Bhakti was and all those kinds of negative things. Just stay focused on acting in, in the right principles. The persons who are exemplary individuals in your life, respect them, have gratitude for them, try to serve them, try to not you know, like pat them, but try to do things that are meaningful to them. Bhakti, that's your bhakti muscle. And it'll grow. You get stronger. Your bhakti will get stronger. Okay, and behind you I think there's a question too. Hare Krishna Maharaj, turn with Prana. Maharaj, I'm Hindi. Maharaj, महाराज जैसे कई बार ऐसा होता है कि हमारे जीवन में कष्ट आते हैं तो हम लोग ये सोचते हैं कि कि ये हमारे कर्मास हैं उसकी वजह से मेरे जीवन में कष्ट आ रहे हैं और कई बार ऐसा लगता है कि मेरे साथ ही ऐसा क्यों होता है मेरे जीवन में ही कष्ट क्यों आते हैं तो उसके लिए क्या प्रैक्टिस है हेल्प मी महाराज our question is that uh, if there are some sufferings that come in my life, some which comes sufferings, sufferings. No. So uh, she thinks that uh, these are my karma, but then some thoughts are like, why these are happening in my life only? Why these are coming to me? You're fortunate. Now misfortune can be a fortune depending on where your heart goes. The heart is that Krishna should be pleased. So if you have some misfortune, it's an opportunity to take deeper shelter of Krishna. If, I'll say it again, if misfortune comes, it may be a hidden opportunity for you to take deeper shelter of Krishna. For example, because of time, I'm only going to mention it, Bali Maharaj. Read the Bali Maharaj story when after surrendering everything, Vamana ties him up like a criminal. He surrendered everything and he got treated like a criminal. That's unfair. But he didn't say that. He didn't feel that. And Vamana said, I did this just to show the world what is the quality of bhakti of this Bali Maharaj. He has taken full shelter of me. And no complaint, no whining, no complaining. Why is this misfortune coming to me? Because I gave everything. And now this misfortune came to me. 
He didn't even think like that. He didn't say it, didn't feel it. So this is this similar to Sri Rupa's question. He is a role model for you. Now how can you get there? Because you're not there. And he is there. Look up to him. Hear about him. Glorify him. Remember him. Serve persons who are like him. And that quality becomes your quality. We're in the material world. And there's a place where there's misfortune that comes all the time. Not sometimes. All the with every, Anyway. What is your... You introspect and look, what's, what's going on here? What's my mission in life? Is it my happiness or Krishna's happiness? What's going on here? Krishna may giving you may be giving you through misfortune an opportunity to, to take deeper shelter of him. Sometimes he does that. Okay, we're past time. It's eight o'clock. And I saw some other hands, but I th think we should end and go on to our very important announcements. Thank you all very much. Hare Krishna.